Today, what we're going to move on to is, is looking at some more of those methods for separating azeotropic systems. So last lecture, as I mentioned, we looked at pressure swing, and then now we're going to be looking at some other examples where pressure swing isn't an opportunity for us to use. <clears throat> so remember when we looked at pressure swing, the key thing we said was that for that to work, the composition of the azeotrope has to change when we change the pressure of the system. Yep. That doesn't happen with all azeotropes, and if that doesn't happen, then we can't use pressure swing distillation, so we have to have some other tools to use in our armory. And the first, the first sort of alternative option we can think about is, is what's called extractive distillation. Okay, And the key to extractive distillation is essentially the feed must have different solvent affinities so that if we, if we were to add a solvent to this, we essentially change their relative volatility. Okay, So because we've got a system with an azeotrope in any way, we're likely to have a feed made of different types of chemicals, potentially a polar and a non-polar component. So there could be a solvent that we can find that we can add to our system. And essentially, it will like one of our components more than the other. And that combination effect uh, will actually change the relative volatility of our key components. Okay? And that may allow us to, to actually achieve a distillation. And we'll see a couple of different examples of how that can work. But the key, the key thing for this method is that the solvent that we pick cannot form an azeotrope with any of our feed components. Okay? So we've got to find a component that has our different affinities to our current feed components, but also doesn't form an azeotrope with either of those feed components. And to actually achieve this, generally we're talking about using a flow rate of solvent that's around the same order of magnitude as the flow rate of the feed. Okay, so to achieve something like this, we are actually using quite a lot of solvent. But the advantage is that we can actually try and recover our solvent, and often we would try and recover our solvent via another distillation column, and then we would recycle our solvent back to that first column. And how we include this solvent in the system depends on what type of system we have. So if we're dealing with a minimum boiling azeotrope, then if you think about it, the system is going to be most at the azeotrope at the top of our column. Yep. So therefore, we want to make sure we've got plenty of solvent at the top of the column. So if we've got a minimum boiling azeotrope system, we tend to add a solvent, <coughs> excuse me, a solvent to the top of our column, and we make sure our solvent has a lower volatility than the key components in our system. And that means we have plenty of solvent in the top of our column, but we've also got plenty of solvent flowing down our column as a liquid, and so we've got very little solvent that's actually taken off as a vapor. Uh, in our overhead product. Okay? Or the alternative is that we've got a maximum boiling azeotrope, and of course in that case, our azeotrope is, is going to be at the bottom of the column. So in there, we can make sure we just add our solvent in with the feed, and again, we want a solvent with a lower volatility. And, the re and you'll see, because we're using a solvent with lower volatilities, in both of these cases, the solvent is essentially coming out of the bottom of our distillation column. Okay? So I always think that there's, there's two ways of thinking about how we can actually use extractive distillation, and that depends on our, on our solvent that we're actually adding to our system. So the simplest case is if we've managed to find a solvent 
and our solvent in our system has a very, very low volatility, so an extremely high boiling point, much higher than any of the components in our distillation column. So, of course, much higher than really our distillation column is operating at. That means that, in reality, our, our solvent doesn't take place in the, it doesn't actually take place in the vapor-liquid equilibria. It always stays as a liquid. But the presence of that liquid affects the relative volatilities between our other components. So an example of that is if we add something like ethylene glycol to ethanol and water, the ethylene glycol has a much higher boiling point than either ethanol or water. So pretty much everywhere in our column, it stays as a liquid. Very, very small vapor fraction. But if we then plot our X versus Y diagram for our ethanol versus water, it moves from this original system here with our azeotrope to this dashed system. Okay, so adding our ethylene glycol actually changes the relative volatilities enough between the water and the ethanol so that we no longer have an azeotrope in our system. So what we can do is essentially we have our ethylene glycol which we add into our first column. And then in that first column we can then separate our ethanol and water because we're now dealing with this dashed equilibrium system. Yep. So it's an easy separation. So the top of our first column, we essentially get our pure ethanol. And then at the bottom of our first column, we basically collect all the water, but we also have all of our ethylene glycol solvent in there because the boiling point's much higher. Okay? So then that, what that means is is our bottom product here is water and ethylene glycol, but they have a difference in boiling point and they don't have an azeotrope between them because that was one of the criteria of picking our solvent. So we can very easily use the second distillation column to recover the water and also recover our pure ethylene glycol, which we can recycle back into our first distillation column. So although we've got a relatively high flow rate of ethylene glycol, in this case, this example here, you can actually see that there's three times the flow rate of solvent is needed to the flow rate of feed. Yeah. So we've got, even though we've got that high amount of solvent, because we're recovering the solvent, then it's actually not too bad. It's not too expensive for the system. Okay, And that's the case where we've picked a solvent where the boiling point is much higher, much less volatile, and essentially it always stays as a liquid in our column. Very little vapour is formed of our solvent. An alternative way of looking at this is, is we've managed to find our solvent, we've managed to find our solvent with a higher boiling point. However, it's only a little bit higher than the components in our feed. So therefore, that solvent actually takes part in the vapor-liquid equilibria, and on each stage in our column, there's actually some vapor solvent as well as some liquid solvent. What that means is, is instead of using this sort of simplified approach where we can think about it as the pseudo-two-component system and then just make sure all our solvent flow rate comes out the bottom, we have to go back to what we've been looking at, uh, and that's moving towards one of our ternary diagram systems. So in this case, we've got exactly the same style of system. We've got our component A and our component B, which are present in our feed, and we've got this azeotrope here between them. And what we're doing is we're adding a solvent, or we can make use of a solvent that has a higher boiling point than either of our components A or B. Okay? And what we need to do is think about how we can use this diagram here and represent a potential sequence 
uh, distillation columns. Okay? So you'll notice, actually, that this first distillation column here doesn't have any solvent. Yep. So we're, we're, we've not added any solvent yet. And what this is, is what's called a pre-concentrator. Okay? And the reason that we sometimes use one of these in our system is that if we're adding our solvent, the important thing with our solvent is actually the ratio of the solvent to the feed. So if we can actually reduce some of our feed volume already, some of the, the flow rate of our feed, then that means we can reduce the amount of solvent we need, so it's a cheaper, it's a cheaper separation. Okay? But of course, because we've only got A and B in our system, we're essentially limited to a distillation column on this axis here, and of course we are limited by our azeotrope. Okay? So in this example, let's take, let's take our feed position of A and B here. Okay? So what we've got is what, about 63% A, remainder B, okay? So in our pre-concentrator column, we can essentially draw that on our ternary diagram like this. So remember, thinking back, what did we need to plot a distillation column on our ternary diagram? So the first, the first rule is that a distillation column the top product, the bottom product, and the feed all lie on a straight line. Yep. And the bottom product and our top product lie on the same residue curve. Okay? So in this case, we can have our straight line with the bottom product here of essentially pure A, and a top product here very near our azeotrope. Okay? And also, we've got this residue curve that goes around the outside of our ternary diagram. So we've satisfied both of our criteria, but we can represent that distillation column as that straight line on the system, as we were doing previously. Okay? Now, of course, when we're when we're thinking about the design of these systems, in this case, we've got a pre-concentrator. But of course, the location of this feed point here is going to affect whether it's economical to have. So although you're removing some of the A from the system and reducing the flow rate that actually you have to add solvent to, you are having to build an extra distillation column. Yep. So you've got a trade-off in costs between is it worthwhile building this column to reduce the amount of solvent I need, yep. or shall I not have one? Okay. And of course, that very much depends on the costs of all the components, the solvent, the distillation column, but also how much A you can actually remove from the system. So in this case, because our feed is quite equidistant between the azeotrope and A, we're removing quite a lot of A from the system. Approximately, if you think of the lever arm rule, approximately 50% of the flow rate yep, is A, because it's about in the middle. But if this feed point here was very close to our azeotrope already, then the amount of A we'd actually extract from that first column would be very small. Yep. So what do we have? So let's say we've got pure A coming out the bottom of this column, and then coming out of the top of our first column is essentially something around the composition of the azeotrope. Okay? So the closer we can get to the azeotrope, the better, because that removes as much A as possible. But of course, the closer we get to the azeotrope, the more difficult the separation is. So potentially the higher reflux ratio we need in the column and the higher number of trays in the column. Another trade-off for us to think about. Hopefully we're quite close to our azeotrope composition, and if we look at our sequence here, essentially we add our pure solvent 
to the mixture that comes out of the first column. Okay? So again, if you remember, you think back when we're adding two streams on a ternary diagram, we can add two streams by drawing a straight line between the two streams that we add, and then the combined mixture of that stream lies somewhere on our straight line. So what we know is our F2, which is the mixture of our D1 and S, lies somewhere on this dashed green line. Okay? But we don't know where, because in this particular case, we're not told how much solvent we need to add. Okay? Now, the next thing that we know is we have a distillation column. And we have one top product, which must be one of our pure components coming out of our system because it's one of our final products. And then we have a bottom product that goes into our third distillation column. Okay? So we have a choice. What do we try and take as a product from our first column? Do we try and take A or do we try and take B as our, as our top product from the first column? Okay? So what do we do to work this out? So we rely on our residue curves. Okay? So we could, we could think about some particular positions on here as our feeds and draw some bow tie regions and see what's available to us. Yeah? Or we can actually look at, we can think about this in a thought experiment. Okay? Based on our two rules that Distillation column must be a straight line, and the top and the bottom must lie on the same residue curve. Okay? So, for instance, if we have A as our top product, can we draw a straight line where our top product is A, we have a, we, we have a straight line that passes through this dashed line, and then we have a bottom product somewhere down here? but does our top and our bottom product lie on the same residue curve? Okay? No, that's impossible, because you can see these residue curves go like this, so it's impossible to draw a straight line in this direction that lies on the same residue curve. Okay? So our other option is having B. Yep. So let's think about having B or almost pure B. So essentially, we want something over here. So we need to draw a straight line that passes through our dashed line that lies on the same residue curve. So let's think about this residue curve at the bottom here. And we've basically got this corner of it that's very close to pure B. Can we draw a straight line from this part of the residue curve through this dashed line that also is on this residue curve? And essentially, yes. We can. Okay? We can draw something like this red line here. Yep. So what that's telling us is we can now have a distillate product, a top product, that's almost pure B. And then we've got a bottom product here, which is a mixture of our A and our solvent. Okay? And what we can also do if we need to is we can now see that the feed point, this F2, must be the point where our red line crosses our dashed green line. Yep. So we can use the lever arm rule now on our dashed green line to work out how much solvent we would have to add to our feed. So we can now calculate our solvent, yep, our solvent flow rate needed for for this separation to occur. Okay? So we've now got our pure B coming out of one column. And then we've got our mixture of A and solvent, but we've still got our final column. So what we essentially need to do is we already know that the bottom product here must be our pure solvent. And realistically, our top product here must be the other component we want, which is pure A. So we can think about having a distillation column that goes down this side here, the straight line through this feed, like this. 
and it lies on the same residue curve, the residue curve that runs down this axis here, and separates our essentially pure A as a top product and our pure solvent as a bottom product, which we can then recycle back in front of our second column. Okay? So what we've done there is we've taken our potential distillation sequence and we've used the knowledge of the residue curves and our distillation rules to plot that on our ternary diagram. Yep. And then, as commented, what we can do is, like, say, use the lever arm rule to calculate the amount of solvent. We can read off the compositions of each of our, our streams and get the flow rates of each of our streams with the lever arm rule. Okay? And then, of course, if we were going to do a full design on that, we now have our rough design, which we could then, first of all, think about looking at a shortcut method to get some of the the minimum reflux ratios or minimum number of stages, and then we could put that into a simulator like Aspen or Hythus to then actually perform our main simulation and then look at the optimization of that system. So, for instance, you know, do we, where, do we, where do we actually do the separation of the pre-concentrator to? Do we leave it up here or do we move it closer to the azeotrope for cost benefits, okay? But this technique allows us to get that initial design which we need to progress forward to actually do the full calculation and design for our system, okay? So does that make sense as a technique? Yeah? Okay. So... The big issue with extractive distillation is that one, one clause that I said, we must pick a solvent that does not form an azeotrope with, any of the, with either of the components in the feed. Okay? But our feed, because that has an azeotrope, they're likely to be either very different chemically, potentially a polar or a non-polar. So finding a solvent that has different interactions with the components, but also doesn't form an azeotrope. And then, of course, added classifications on top, exactly like we had with liquid, liquid extraction. So things like the solvent isn't really, really toxic. The solvent is cheap enough to use. Okay? Limits our choices. So maybe we can't find a solvent that doesn't form an azeotrope with one of our components. Okay. But if it does form an azeotrope with one of our components, we can essentially use a modified version of extractive distillation, which is generally classed as this homogeneous azeotropic distillation. Okay. And in this case, what we do is we still run the same style of system, but we don't need a solvent or an entrainer that's subject to the, such the restriction of no azeotrope. It can form an azeotrope with one of our components. Okay? And instead of recycling that pure solvent or that pure entrainer, we can then think about recycling the, that azeotrope. Okay? <clears throat> so let's think about an example system for that. So, you might recognize our ternary diagram from the other week, the one that we looked at drawing our approximate residue curve technique for. So, in this case, what we've got is we've got a feed here, which is our mixture of A and B, and we've got an azeotrope between A and B, and also, just to make it a bit more difficult, we've got this ternary azeotrope that has this little part distillation boundary in the way. We've managed to find our, extra, uh, our entrainer or our solvent, but we've got an azeotrope between E and our component A, which happens to form this distillation boundary uh, between uh, that azeotrope and the pure component B. So using distillation, 
to actually get our pure entrainer isn't possible because we can't cross that distillation boundary. Okay? So what we can do is something very similar to what we did before. So in this case, you'll notice I've not bothered with the pre-concentrator. Okay? So we're just going to start from our initial feed. So we've got our initial feed of A and B, and what we're doing, instead of recycling that pure entrainer, we're recycling the azeotrope of our, one of our components and our solvent entrainer. Okay? So in this case, we know that we can represent this mass balance as essentially between that azeotrope and our feed, exactly the same as what we've just done. Okay? So again, thinking about the same process, we now know we've got a feed into our first column that lies somewhere on this line. And in this case, we're told that it's actually B. We want B to be the pure component that comes out of the bottom of our column. Yeah. So can we essentially draw a straight line from component B that passes through our green dashed line and lies on the same residue curve. Yes, we can. And we can actually draw something like this. So this is going on this residue curve that goes all the way around the outside of our distillation region. Okay? Now again, here, we've taken a decision. We've taken a decision to draw this red line here. We could have drawn it slightly higher up, it would still work, or slightly lower down, or slightly shorter. Okay? And that will change, that's essentially related to the amount of our azeotrope that we're recycling around, and that is an optimization decision we can do after we've got our initial design. Okay? So in this case, we've now got our pure B as our bottom product and our mix of A and E as our top product, which we're putting into another distillation column, where we know we're getting A as a top product and we must have our A azeotrope to recycle, so we can represent that by this line here. Again, straight line, bottom feed, uh, top product and the bottom product and the top product on the same distillation curve, okay? The same residue curve. I should get that on the t-shirt. <laughs> yep, that's the two key things, okay? So now we've represented this system also on our ternary diagram, yep? Okay? So what I want to do is, to, is then to think, well, what if, what if we can't use the, the methods that we've currently looked at? So, for the first one with the extractive distillation, we had to find a solvent that didn't have any azeotropes. To use the homogeneous azeotropic distillation technique, we had to find a solvent that formed an that had an azeotrope with basically our components. However, to actually form the pattern of residue curves needed to apply that technique, the azeotrope that was formed actually has to be a maximum boiling azeotrope. Okay? So for the last technique that homogeneous azeotropic distillation to work, the azeotrope that's actually formed has to be a maximum boiling azeotrope. However, maximum boiling azeotropes are quite rare in comparison to minimum boiling azeotropes. So the likelihood of finding a solvent that forms that maximum boiling azeotrope is low. So maybe for many systems we can't find one of those azeotropes. But actually, we can think about a different technique that we can also use. So, as you see, what we're doing is we're essentially moving up 
in how difficult these techniques are and likely to be how costly these techniques are. So like pressure swing is quite simple, only needs two columns, we don't need a solvent. Then we move on to one where we have a solvent. Yep, so we're essentially trying to rule out as we go along these, these techniques which are likely to be cheaper. So if we can't get one that forms a maximum boiling azeotrope, we can probably find a solvent that forms a minimum boiling azeotrope. And in fact, often we can find a solvent or an entrainer that forms either a binary or a ternary heterogeneous azeotrope. Okay? And we've got a big advantage by forming a heterogeneous azeotrope. Okay? And that big advantage is we immediately have a second separation technique which we can use. And that second separation technique is essentially what you were looking at at the start of the course, which is liquid-liquid extraction. So where that heterogeneous azeotrope falls, it has two liquid phases which also separate. So you can actually look at a second separation as well as our distillation. And what we tend to do is we tend to set the overhead vapor from one of our columns as close as we can to that heterogeneous azeotrope. And that means when we condense that, we form two separate liquid phases which we can decant and then we've also got an added separation. Okay. And the big advantage of that is that often the, the two liquid phases lie in different distillation regions. Yep. So the thing that we've been struggling with all along is that we've got azeotropes or distillation boundaries in the way and we can't cross those with just distillation columns. Yeah? So we've been limited to the separation. So like with the, eight, with the homogeneous azeotropic distillation, we were limited and had to recycle our azeotrope round. Okay? And we, because we couldn't get to our pure entrainer because of that distillation boundary. But now, if we've got this option, because we've got this added liquid phase, which actually gives us products in different distillation regions, we can now start to move more around our ternary diagram and actually look at separating to get components which are in different distillation regions. Okay? So with our heterogeneous, what we get as our products, they don't all need to be in the same distillation region because we've got this liquid-liquid extraction step. Okay? So, for example, let's take this system here. So we've got our component A, we've got our component B, and we've got our solvent or entrainer that we've added here. We, of course, weren't able to do our original A-B separation because we've got this azeotrope in the way. But we found this in trainer that could potentially work, but actually what it's still got is, it's formed a ternary azeotrope here, and we've got a distillation boundary that is now between A and B. So if we were just using distillation columns, we wouldn't be able to cross that boundary. But that distillation boundary is only a problem to distillation. A different separation technique can get past it. One would be liquid-liquid extraction. So we can make use of our liquid-liquid extraction here. So if we produce a product that's basically at our ternary azeotrope here, when we condense this, it forms two liquid phases, one of this composition and one of this composition. And you can see that these are already in two different distillation regions. So if we have a distillation column on this product here, we can get anything in this region. And if we have a distillation column on this product here, we can get anything in this region. Yep. So already, we've got more options available to us. So this is, is typically what a heterogeneous 
system looks like. So we've got our column, which forms our, goes towards our ternary or our heterogeneous azeotrope. And then we've got our added decanter to give us our two liquid phases. And then we potentially have one or two other columns, depending on if we've got a pre-concentrator or not in our system. Okay. So because this system's a little bit more complicated, we actually just need to think about a bit of a rearrangement before we actually can start to plot these on our ternary diagram. Because on our ternary diagram, what we've been plotting, because what's easy for us to plot, is distillation columns that have one feed and a top product and a bottom product, and and mass balances, so essentially two feeds joining together to form one feed, okay? Or the opposite, one being separated to form two, okay? But if we look at this system here, so let's take this column for an example. We have one feed going in here because it's based on our decanter, and we also have a second feed. So we've actually got two, two feeds. So that's how we would physically build the system, mechanically build the system, but we can think about a simple rearrangement to allow us to draw them on our system. So the first rearrangement we can think about is around our reflux and our decanter. So it, what we may typically do is have is condense into our decanter, and then you can see that we've got some of one of our phases going back into our column and some of the other phase also going back into the column. Okay? And that's acting as both a reflux but also a liquid stream. But what we can do is just separate that out. So first of all, we have our reflux and then we separately go into our decanter. So we're just simplifying what we physically build to what we want to look at designing. The second stage is, as I mentioned, because of that, we've got two feeds. Okay? But we can mix those two feeds before they get to the column, so we just have one feed into the column. So in this case, we can do that, and we're still just taking our L2 and our D1 and mixing them together. So now you can see what we've done is we've actually changed this column back so it's got one feed and just our two standard top and bottom product. But it's exactly the same in terms of separation. Okay. Okay. And then finally we've got to think about the same for our last column where we've got one feed and then this is a feed going in. And again we can just combine them before this column so we've got a standard column. So all we've done is looked at is essentially looked at what we would build versus what we would, what we're actually going to, to draw to help us design it, okay? And then when we've got that and we've identified the flow rates and the composition for all these streams, we can then just do the process back to, to turn it back into what we would actually build, okay? So it's just a little trick that we need to do to help us use this technique to design these heterogeneous systems, okay? So now we've got this rearranged system, we can actually think about drawing that on, on our diagram, okay? And what I'm hopefully going to do is to actually draw this for you. So instead of just seeing the sort of animated version, um, you can see the example a bit more like when, when you're trying to do these systems. So what we really need to think about is what information we've got for our system. Because we don't always have all the information when we're drawing these. Okay? So in this case, we're given our feed, our F1, which is our feed into the system. Okay? But what do we do first is actually start thinking about how we're, we're going to draw the system. Well, if you remember what we said, what we really want to do is try and get 
a, a product from the top of one of our distillation columns that's very near to that ternary azeotrope. Okay? And the reason that we do that is, first of all, is that ternary azeotrope splits into two liquid phases, which is good and useful for us. But also, if we're in this region, this region, or this region, that ternary azeotrope is available to us from a distillation column. Yep. So we're not actually limiting how we have to access that ternary azeotrope. So we're not defining what separation is occurring in this distillation column. We're just thinking about this decanter separation. Okay. So in that case, we can essentially start with an estimate for our system. And say that we can basically draw a liquid-liquid separation that exists across here. And we can define this as an E-rich, and we can define this as an E-lean. So basically, the E-rich has lots of entrainer in, and the E-lean has very little entrainer in. Okay? And now after... Now, as we then start to develop the system further on, we may find that we need to move exactly which point we're separating, okay? But we can do that later if we need to. But to start with, we always access that ternary azeotrope that goes across the liquid-liquid the region, okay? So if we look at our system here, we essentially have one of our liquid phases that goes into one of our columns, and one that goes to our second column. One of them is mixed with our initial feed, and one of them is mixed with what is being recycled from our labelled here column one. Now, logically, if you're mixing something with the feed, you would want to mix something with the feed that is of a similar composition. That is what you'd want to try and do first. Okay? Also, this column here, column two, is the column that has the azeotropic separation in. Right? So that's typically the column where we want lots of the entrainer. So at E rich, we would also likely put into our column that actually has has the uh, azeotrope in, okay? So that means if the system is that way round, then because we know our F1, and we know our, in this case, lean phase, or our liquid-liquid phase that's very similar to the feed, then we can actually mix those two together, which, of course, is a straight line drawn between our F1 and our E lean point, okay? So then continuing to look at our system, essentially that mixture is what we're actually distilling in our first column. And in this column one, we essentially want B as our bottom product, and then we want something as our top product which we can then mix, okay? So if we've got a feed somewhere on this blue line, and we want B as our bottom product, then we would be looking at a distillation column that essentially is somewhere like this, okay? So let's just draw that in for now. And that would be our, our column one, okay? And we would end up with our, our bottom product and our top product, okay? Now, in this case, where we've drawn our D1, then 
what we have to think about is the same things that we had to think about when we were looking at this method before. So if we had residue curves on this diagram, we would need to make sure that the distillate and our bottom product lie, lay on the same residue curve. And also, the exact point of this D1 here, do we go closer to this distillation boundary? Do we go slightly further away? Do we go slightly closer to the azeotrope? Do we go slightly closer away? Okay. So those questions are due to uh, optimization questions, yes? So this part gives us our initial design, and when we've got that, we can then look at the exact composition of D1 to see what gives us an optimum cheap design. Yep. But this process is giving us our initial design. What we do want to do, however, is we do want to try and avoid our D1 being in this two-phase region. Because if we're inside the two-phase region, then in our distillation column, on our stages, we can have essentially uh, two liquids forming on our stages, which reduces the efficiency of our plates in our distillation column. So we kind of want to avoid going into the two-phase region if we can. Okay? So the next thing that we have on our diagram is we now have D1, and we know D1, and we know our L2, which we've also referred to as E rich. Okay? And what we do is we have to mix those two together. So essentially, to mix those two together, we just represent that by our straight line again, our blue straight line. And then, really, we only have one thing left that we need to think about for this system. And that is our column two. And that is the distillation column that gives us our ternary azeotrope at the top and hopefully gives us pure A at the bottom. Okay? So now is really the crucial point. So hopefully we've done everything okay up to this point. So we need to be able to draw a straight line on our diagram that goes from our pure component A to our ternary azeotrope, which passes through this blue line that we've just drawn. Yep. And hopefully you can see that we can do that with a straight line like that. So that would be our column two in this situation, okay? I'll take that back to a, a multicolored version of that process. But you can see what we did is we essentially followed exactly the same things as we were doing before. But in this case, we've just got the added difficulty or, in fact, an added advantage that we've got that liquid-liquid extraction step. So we've got our two distillation columns. We've got our blue column and our orange column doing our sort of main part of the separation. And then we're taking advantage of one, our liquid-liquid region, the red line here, to move us around the distillation column, uh, to move us around our ternary diagram. And also, we're taking advantage of being able to mix those streams together to create feeds in the distillation regions that we need to allow us to use a distillation column to get the products that we want. Okay? And then, as mentioned, what we can do is we can then take, we could then read these compositions off, we could use the lever arm rule or mass balances to look at getting some of the compositions, which we can then put onto our system here, which we could then go on to put into a program like Aspen or Hyasis to then allow us to do the optimization of the system. 
but of course Aspen or HiSys requires us to have an initial guess for that to actually be able to solve the, the system we put in. And the more complicated the system, the better that initial guess essentially needs to be uh, for it to actually solve. Okay? And the other advantage is, is you can also use this to check that your solution is giving you, your solution in Aspen, your solution in HiSys, is giving you something that's sensible okay? and really works. So there's one remaining technique that I want to mention as well. So there's a, a more a newer sort of technique in the distillation, in the distillation family, and that's reactive distillation. So reactive distillation is essentially a simultaneous chemical reaction and distillation together. Okay? And the reaction normally takes place in the liquid phase and we perhaps need a solid catalyst to do that. So instead of just having our, our trays in our distillation column, we can potentially have our trays with catalyst on, or we can have a packed distillation column where that packing also contains our catalyst within that. Okay? And it can be used so to essentially separate our azeotropic mixture of A and B, but instead of just adding our solvent that affects our vapor-liquid equilibria, we add a solvent that actually reacts with, with one of our components in the system uh, to form a new chemical which has a more advantageous vapor-liquid equilibrium for us to work with. Uh, but hopefully the solvent we picked and the reaction that we do is reversible so then we can recover our initial component. Yep. So, for example, in this case, we've got our A and B as our initial feed, and you can see based on their relative volatilities that they're incredibly close together and very difficult to separate. But what we've managed to find is we've managed to find an entrainer that we can add E, our solvent, that reacts with component B in a reversible reaction to form component C. And component C has a very different relative volatility to our component A. So separating A and C is relatively easy to do. And also the solvent or entrainer we've picked also has a different relative volatility, so it's also if needed easier to separate E and A as well. So as well as our vapor-liquid equilibrium, we also have our reaction. So as we move up the column, essentially B is being reacted to C, so our C separates. So our separation is now actually on A, E and C rather than A and B. And then we have our pure A essentially separated. And at the bottom of our column, we have E and C. But because E and C are part of a reversible reaction, we can then change the conditions so that C then reacts back to form our original component B and our entrainer or solvent E again. And then we could recycle E back to our column. So what we're taking advantage of is that we also can have a reaction in our system, okay? But as you can imagine, this is obviously quite a complex system and can be very expensive because we need a solvent, we need a catalyst, we then need the reversible reaction. So this is kind of used in systems where some of the other separation techniques that we've already talked about are just not possible, okay? But this reactive distillation is... is is a new technique that's sort of becoming more popular within industry to tackle some of the more difficult separations. And it does have a big potential to save energy over some of the more complicated distillation sequences that we need to separate azeotropic distillation, uh, azeotropes, azeotropic components with. Okay?
So we've basically covered today the sort of key methods for actually separating our azeotropic systems. So we've had abstractive distillation, when we, can ha when we can find a solvent that doesn't form any azeotropes. Homogeneous, if we can find a solvent that just forms a maximum boiling azeotrope with one of our components. If, we can't, if, we, if neither of those options are available to us, we've got a heterogeneous azeotropic distillation where we take advantage of that heterogeneous azeotrope and take advantage of that liquid-liquid separation step with our decanter. And then finally, we've just had sort of a quick thought to know that reactive distillation is a technique that is also possible and we couple our VLE separation with a reversible reaction to help us when we've got a potential azeotrope or a very difficult separation in our system.